Hi, this is Elia Fishman, and welcome to part four of our talk on cinematic rendering. And the last few parts, we've been speaking about clinical applications that we use routinely in practice 365 days of the year. And let's continue with that. Now, one of the things I have done a bit of, but I think we need to do more, is doing cinematic rendering in patients with positive oral contrast. And I'll just show you some examples and maybe leave you this to think about. This is a nice case. There's some dilated, thick, and small bowel loops. They're dilated. Uh, you can see fold thickening. You can see it nicely on the coronal views, and you can see it nicely as well on the patient's volume rendered imaging. But look at the cinematic. Look how nicely we can use the positive contrast as a marker for looking at fold thickening, looking at the housefolds folds of the colon, and the thickening of the small bowel folds in addition to looking at the stomach. You can think about how we can display this through a range of perspectives and perhaps optimize the visualization of bowel. And this may be a dedicated cinematic rendering small bowel exam or large bowel exam. That's something I think we should consider. And again, if we could use the interluminal type views like we do with cardiac, perhaps there'll be a way of detecting polyps in the colon. In this article, we spoke about this virtual fluoroscopy and it, indeed, it's something we've not pursued perhaps like we should, but I think it's definitely a possibility. Again, the rendering techniques are very much based on the trapezoids, which you can see here that we developed. And here's just a nice example showing you the interactivity of the, uh, the case, where again, now we can look at small bowel and large bowel. Again, if you time things correctly, you could do only small bowel or only large bowel. But again, get a good feel of the haustral folds. Get a good feel of the small bowel folds and put all of that together. It should be really, really interesting as we go forward in doing processes like this. So I think one of the things with cinematic rendering we like to mention when we give talks is that although we've done a lot and other people have done a lot, it's really not all that much when compared with the infinite possibilities that can be done. Here's a patient with Crohn's disease. You see the thickened bowel. You see the, the thickening of the descending colon, for example, the irregularity of the folds. And then as you track downward, look at those folds very nicely shown. In the, in the cinematic rendered views, look at the mesenteric vessels, look at the right colon. I think one of the things we are seeing is the ability to use cinematic rendering as a way of looking at both large and small bowel pathology. Now these, of course, are the typical studies done with water as the contrast agent, but look how nicely you can see the edematous changes in the folds, particularly in the descending colon, and again, as I change the rendering parameters, you can optimize that visualization. Here's a patient with ischemic small bowel with a clot in the portal vein and SMV. You see the thickened small bowel loops, the edema, the haziness in the mesentery, and the extent of involvement. And how does that look when you go to cinematic? Look how nicely you can see the clot right there. Look at the fold pattern. You can see the edema, the prominent vasa recta, the thrombus, and the abnormalities in the patient's small bowel. You can see the small bowel more distally is red. Remember I showed you before, red means water. It means it's edematous. It's enhancing edematous, prominent fold pattern, prominent haustral folds. All of the things that you think about with inflammatory bowel disease now, in the right setting, this could be graft versus host, it could be ischemia, it could be Crohn's. But again, look at the mucosal enhancement, the submucosal edema, look at the, uh, the vasculature. Again, there's the thrombus, really nicely shown on these images. And again, the ability to look at colon and small bowel using cinematic rendering is something we're putting a lot of effort in, and you'll see some new articles about that soon. But look at the detail in this patient with ischemic bowel. Again, the ability to change the rendering. Um, we would like to be able to optimize things. Here it's a little bit, the bowel is not as well seen because I'm trying to accentuate a bit more the vessels. 
And here the vessels are a little less well seen, but you can see all of those changes in the bow wall. Just a really nice example. And again, interactively, here's how I would be looking at it if I was really looking at the case. I'd be using the box to cut through, looking at the vessel, including the portal vein and SMB thrombus, but looking at the extent of bowel involvement and the orientation. It's one thing, again, to, I'll say it again, to have static views, that's great, but when you're interpreting a case, the zooming, the flying through, all of the things we need to do, that interactivity is really hard to replace. Now, the, when I do the interactivity, of course, I can stop and take the best pictures that I want and I want to show, but my analysis, my report, is really based on the interactive images, which you can see here. And here's just, again, another rendering interactively of the same patient. Again, think about this as you go back and try to look at cinematic rendering in your practice. You can see staples in the abdominal wall. Cinematic rendering is good from the abdominal wall, from the skin to the sub-Q fat, deep into the organs, deep into the vessels. And again, it's just simply using the cut planes and changing the rendering parameters that really will make our job the easiest. Here's a patient with a large small bowel tumor. This was a GIST tumor with lots of vascularity. The surgeon wanted to resect it. You can see, look how large that mass is. And at first glance, you're going to say, oh my God, this can't be resected. But large GIST tumors are typically resected. Sometimes they'll give Gleevec first and then resect them. But look at the vascularity. So for the surgeon, we provided the vascular maps. When the surgeon went in, they knew exactly what vessels they would be seeing, what vessels they would have to sacrifice. Again, Here's some of the vascularity in the tumor proper with the large prominent collateral vessels involving the tumor. Again, the ability to see the preoperative plan and the surgeon knows what they can expect when they go in. And it also helps them determine whether they should try the surgery or not. This surgery is not for the faint of heart, but this patient did incredibly well with this large resection of a large vascular gist tumor. Another patient, just to share a nice example, a patient with right lower quadrant pain and suspected bowel obstruction. You can see the patient's small bowel is dilated, and there's some soft tissue right in the right lower quadrant. Is that in the terminal ilium or ileocecal valve or cecal level? Hard to be certain, but there it is really nicely on the volume rendered of views. We're using cinematic rendering, very nicely showing the dilated loops of bowel, fluid filled. There's the mass. So it could be a tumor at the very distal aspect of the patient's ilium or ileocecal valve level. You can see the extent, and the surgeon knows precisely what needs to be done. Transition points for small bowel obstruction are often hard to determine. Looking at things in a volume will make it easier. We talk about just looking at routine coronals interactively as a way of defining small bowel obstruction transition points and using cinematic rendering will perhaps make it better. You can see this case of lymphoma, large mesenteric nodes, multiple mesenteric nodes, and I just wanted to show you how this would look with cinematic rendering. A really nice look at the bowel, the multiple nodes, looking at the vessels, and really looking at everything in a combination. So again, a really nice example. Let's move over to the kidneys. We've written a bunch about the kidneys, and I can give a full hour talk on that, but let me just look at a few points that we will make. In complex renal masses, when you're planning surgery, be it laparoscopic or open, whether you're trying to determine whether a patient needs a nephrectomy or a partial nephrectomy, a goal is, of course, partial nephrectomies, 3D imaging has often proved a value. Here's a large mass, hypovascular lower pole left kidney, which was a papillary renal cell carcinoma. Here's the 3D rendering showing you the mass, central necrosis. You can see the orientation to the patient's renal pelvis and collecting systems and to the renal artery. You can see why this patient would be a great candidate for a partial nephrectomy. Or this patient with a large hypervascular necrotic mass on axial imaging and coronal imaging in the right kidney. 
you can see some of the neovascularity, the relationship to the renal artery and vein. And look how nice it looks on the cinematic. That hypervascular lesion, the central necrosis, as you go through the feeding vessels, just a very large tumor. Because of its central extension, this tumor would not be ideal for a partial nephrectomy. Again, just a really nice example showing you the tumor, the neovascularity, the orientation of tumor to normal kidney, and orientation of kidney to artery and vein are nicely shown in this example. And again, here's a few more different renderings. You can see how I can really accentuate the tumor normal kidney interface. We've also shown how we can look at things like transitional cell tumors, how we can look at the calyces, how we can look at the ureter, and that's in one of our articles, and it will be coming soon in one of our talks. Now, the use of cinematic rendering, as shown a moment ago, for urothelial tumors is indeed very real. The ability to look at the calyces in 3D, look at the ureter and bladder, all become very valuable. Now, when we think about the kidneys and hematuria, hematuria can be renal cell carcinoma, but can be pyelonephritis, but it also can be vasculitis. This was a patient with hematuria and muscle weakness. If you look quickly at the kidneys, this was thought to be maybe stones or just some contrast, but this is arterial phase and there was nothing on the non-contrast. When you go from the coronals to the MIP, you see multiple small aneurysms throughout both renal arteries, as well as in the spleen and splenic artery, as well as in mesenteric vessels. And this was a case of polyarthritis nodosa. Look how nicely you can see all of these micro aneurysms when you look at the patient's cinematic rendered views. Now, in this case, this patient eventually was treated with steroids and a uh, really uh, impressive drug treatment therapy, and a year later, those aneurysms were no longer present. But you can see the detail of what we can do with cinematic rendering. Look at those small branch vessels off the SMA and the small aneurysms measuring two or three millimeters. Just really, really impressive. We had a case recently, and we've seen cases in the past of segmental arterial medialysis. It's an unusual condition. It's a non-inflammatory disease affecting middle aged and older patients. You have a vasculitis. It typically involves mesenteric vessels, especially the SMA. Differential would include polyarthritis nodosa, as you just saw, as well as things like fibromuscular dysplasia, but the appearance is different in those cases. Here's just a nice example. You can see there's a dissection in the SMA. These patients often present with spontaneous bleeds. And you look at the coronal, you can see as the SMA branches, the left limb is thickened, the right limb is irregular. You can see that better if you're looking at the MIP imaging right here. You could see it even better when you look at the cinematic rendering. Look at the areas of narrowing, of thickening, Look at the vasculitis and the dissection of the SMA. This will be likely SAM as a diagnosis. And here's just some more of the renderings. So you get a very good feel of what we can do. And of course, looking at vessels, we're not limited. I showed you before the aorta, but here's an example of a femoral artery pseudoaneurysm, nicely shown with the volume rendering and the MIP imaging. Here it is with the color-coded volume rendering, nicely showing you the outpouching of that large pseudoaneurysm. But look how much better it is with cinematic rendering. First of all, I can show you the skin and soft tissues and the induration present. Then I can show you the pseudoaneurysm. Then I can show you the skin, the bulging. They thought this was an abscess, it was a pseudoaneurysm. You can see as we cut through the skin, you can look at the hip, the relationship of the patient's of superficial femoral artery to the pseudoaneurysm, how the vessel is narrowed. Again, we could accentuate what is it we see, even the relationship to the skin beautifully shown with cinematic rendering. Here I take away the skin, I take away the bones, I take away everything but that pseudoaneurysm. You can see the narrowing at the level of the pseudoaneurysm. And again, just a range of perspectives of what we can show. And I think it's very impressive when you think about it, 
This case is a really nice example to me of the interactivity, also for preoperative planning, where exactly we're dealing with the pseudoaneurysm, what's its relationship to native vessel, what's its relationship to other structures nearby. All of that very nicely shown when you look at this example. So again, it's very, very important to be able to do that. And in the bottom image, I've taken away everything, only left the native vessels and the pseudoaneurysm. Again, really a good way of analyzing. If you say, well, does it add anything? Well, the aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm is seen on the axial images. That's easy. But everything else, managing, understanding the extent, and planning how to operate or embolize becomes very critical from these 3D maps. So indeed, it's very exciting. And here's just showing you some of the images. Again, one of the challenges to me with cinematic rendering is you can make so many images if you wanted to, I could spend all day doing a couple of cases and really getting incredible images. But you need to get incredible images, but spend less than five minutes a case. In terms of vessels, here's a patient with SVC occlusion, and the collateral vessels are going through the chest wall and abdominal wall, really nicely showing you the extent of collateral vessels. Uh, really, really impressive in that regard. And you can see it here again as we look at uh, the images interactively, giving you a good feel of how we can look at the subcutaneous tissues, how we can look at muscle. And again, it's all a matter of the rendering technique you use, the lighting model and shadowing you use to be able to see precisely what you need to be looking at. Look how the collaterals drain down to the femoral vessels. Just a really, really nice example and really well shown in this case. So we've now looked at a range of vascular processes, whether it's the thoracic aorta with a uh, ulceration, whether it's a dissection, whether it's a coarctation, whether it's SAM, whether it's vessel encasement by a tumor, or collaterals in a patient with SVC syndrome. You can see the details, and I'll just show you a lower extremity. This is a normal, but look at the detail of the vessels of the foot. Look at the dorsum of the foot. Look at the detail of the branching to the individual digits. And again, changing the rendering parameters to make the vessels more or less obvious. The relationship to skin and to muscle will vary depending how you set things up. I didn't go into much musculoskeletal applications. That's something we could do at a separate lecture. But here was a great case of a patient with increasing pain in the arm. Patient had a femur, patient had a humerus fracture. And the arm looks a little bit swollen, and you can see the angulation, and they were going to repair this humerus. The question was, why was the patient having pain? Well, the axillary to brachial artery is intact, as are the radial and ulnar arteries. But when you did cinematic rendering of the skin, look at all of those blisters. This patient was developing a compartment syndrome. Now, you could say, why did they not notice this? Well, they wrapped up the patient's arm, put it by the side, and the whole arm was covered. So nobody saw these blisters. But look how obvious it is on cinematic rendering. No, we're not trying to replace physical exam, but again, showing you the details from the fracture to the vessels, to the muscles, to the skin, and this patient's blisters. Here's another patient with a femur fracture. You can see that the vessels are intact, the SFA, there's no active bleed, there's no vessel injury. And again, going from the muscle to the vessels and showing the vessels and then showing the bone and then taking away the vessels and showing the bone in better detail, where you see the angulation and fragmentation of the femur fracture. Again, great for preoperative planning. And here's a patient with back pain. There's a soft tissue mass involving the left psoas muscle, which is a neurogenic tumor, ends up being a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor in a patient with neurofibromatosis. But look at the detail. Okay, there you see on the, the coronal views with volume rendering, the destruction of portions of the L4 vertebral body. And you can see the soft tissue mass. But here it is with cinematic. From below, look at the erosion of bone. Look at the soft tissue mass and its relationship to the psoas. Very nicely defined. And then here on the coronal view, the bony erosion, the positioning of the mass, and the extent of the mass. And then from the sagittal view, 
I really love the way the neural foramen is widened. Here's a normal. Look how the bony erosion took place. And just a really nice example of showing that with cinematic rendering. And here's a few more targeted views. So again, you can see here I'm showing you the tumor, I'm showing you the bone, I'm showing you the erosion, and I'm showing you the vasculature. All in a single exam and all with different cinematic renderings done. So in terms of clinical practice, reality, you need presets. You need to develop those presets to speed up your practice. Presets may change and will change depending on the application. And even in the same application, I mentioned pancreas, I have 10 to 15 presets depending what I'm looking for. That may not be ideal, but that's realistic depending on the arterial phase or venous phase or speed of injection or amount of body fat. So again, process and progress go hand in hand. AI may prove to be of value, and I think it will in the future, for choosing the best image displays on the data sets used and can help us provide optimal presets by analyzing the trapezoids. I got a feeling a computer could do the trapezoids better than I can. So again, interactivity is critical. I showed you lots of cases with video and static images. The static images are just what I see on the video for documentation, but my interactivity is ideal for me. Now, what else is coming? Well, maybe we should look at things more than just on the screen. Maybe things like the HoloLens will work well. Maybe there's different display techniques that will work well. And that's what part five is gonna talk about. Where we think we're going, some of the newer things we're doing, including multi data sets like PET CT. And let's come back and finish off part five in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh, so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.